Within a vast, mysterious universe, whose origin and future are incomprehensible to human minds, there spins a small planet that houses a variegated human family. Those of us concerned about the right to be variegated are determined to preserve the wall of separation between church and state and the freedoms ensured by the First Amendment to our Constitution, which begins, Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. Food for Thought Productions is pleased to present Mr. Fritz Stevens, director of the Center for Inquiry, West, who will introduce Ms. Wendy McElroy. Wendy McElroy is a uh, historian of free thought, especially uh, women in free thought. Uh, she's a libertarian, and uh, she's written for uh, a number of journals, Liberty, Reason, Marie Claire, and also Free Inquiry. She's also the author of a book, XXX, A Woman's Right to Pornography. Uh, I think you'll uh, really enjoy what uh, Wendy has to say. Wendy McElroy. As a humanist and as a feminist and as a sex worker researcher, I want to address one of the most important questions that was discussed at the International Congress on Prostitution. And that is whether or not the new laws being enacted at the insistence at the behest of feminists are in fact harming or helping the women that they are intended to protect, the prostitute. Now, in essence, there has been a big change in the laws in prostitution in the last two years. And the change has largely been to target the men that are involved in prostitution, to target the pimps and to target the johns. Uh, the three vice cops that I spoke to at the International Congress basically said that their arrests in their city are now about 50% the men, 50% the women. That is a tremendous change. Before, it was almost unknown that the man would be arrested. When men are arrested now, they are basically given the choice of having something on their jail record, on their permanent record, or they can go to what's called a John School. Now, a John School was an idea uh, originated by Norma Hotling, who is an ex-streetwalker, an ex-drug addict, whose experiences on the street were apparently horrendous. She founded something called SAGE, which is Standing Against Global Exploitation. Together with the Vice Department of the San Francisco PD, she came up with a program by which arrested Johns could clear their record if they wished to pay $500 to undergo John School. That was a day of intensive seminar where they sat in one place and had literally ex-street walkers, feminists and social workers and vice cops lecture them on the damage they were doing to women, on the damage they were doing to their own bodies through STDs. Ministers came and told them on the damage they were doing to their spirituality. Now, these new laws, the John schools, the targeting of pimps, the targeting of procurers, has caused such a deep and extreme bitterness and schism between the feminist movement and the prostitutes' rights movement that all dialogue is now dead. And this may not surprise anyone because you might say, well, why would a prostitute and a feminist find common ground? Are they going to talk about affirmative action? You know, what, what are we talking about here? But I want to give you just a very thumbnail sketch of the prostitutes' rights movement in America to give you a, a sense of why this is a, a disastrous occurrence. Coyote, which is cast off your old tired ethics, emerged on Mother's Day, 1974, in San Francisco from a group that was called WHO, an acronym for whores, housewives, and others. <laughs> the others referred to were lesbians. That was a juncture in time that politically you could not even whisper the word. This was an early connection with feminism because the prostitutes' rights movement and the feminist movement were virtually the only two movements that would come out and, and defend and protect lesbians. Now, originally, Coyote's intention was twofold. Excuse me. First, to provide community services in the San Francisco area for whores, for example. They gave them business suits to wear to court when they were being convicted. And the second purpose was to highlight the police abuse of local prostitutes. And Coyote SF which was founded by Margot St. James, and I, I know for a fact because Mar Margot herself has expressed huge surprise, 
She was amazed when a national prostitutes' rights movement coalesced, just took off from this whole idea of prostitutes organizing to give practical help to the women on the street. Within one year, Coyote claimed a membership of over 1,000, despite the fact that all of the people who were registering their names were criminals and making themselves subject to prosecution. And by the end of 1974, at the end of the year, it boasted a membership of over 10,000. Coyote even received a nod of approval from the reigning feminist orthodoxy, Gloria Steinem, and Ms. Magazine, who applauded Margot St. James and said, quote, her drawing power seems to be based on her genuine liking for people, coupled with a shrewd exploitation of herself. Her conversation is humorously profane, full of body puns and frank revelations about her sexual ta ta excuse me, tests, all intermingled with serious rhetoric about her mission to change the laws and image of prostitution. As late as 1979, whores, which is the preferred term of prostitute activists, whores and feminists were actively cooperating. Coyote signed a petition with now what was called a kiss and tell campaign. And this was basically to further the ERA effort. Quoting from Coyote Howells, which is their newsletter in 1979, they wrote, quote, Coyote has called on all prostitutes to join the international kiss and tell campaign to convince legislators that it is in their best interest to support the decriminalization of prostitution, the Equal Rights Amendment, abortion funding, lesbian and gay rights, and all other issues of importance to women. The organizers of the campaign are urging that the names of legislatures who have consistently voted against these issues, yet are regular patrons of prostitutes, be turned over to feminist organizations for their use." End quote. Now, the prostitutes' rights movement was killed by an unexpected assassin, and that was the AIDS virus. In the understandable hysteria that surrounded the AIDS crisis, the American public came to perceive the prostitute as a cause of contamination every bit as dangerous as IV needle use, even though the CDC has clearly shown that it's not the case. At the same moment, feminism also turned against the prostitutes' rights movement and became publicly excoriating prostitutes and prostitution as a form of patriarchal abuse of women and prostitutes who were organizing, saying it was their right to sell their bodies as patriarchal dupes as pathetic victims of male white culture. In 1985, Margot St. James, again the founder of Coyote, left the United States to live in France, citing the, the sexually conservative swing in the American feminist movement as one of her motives in leaving. Now, there's been a tremendous shift within feminism ever since the early 1980s. And it's continuing and it's basically getting to the point where there is a division between what is called anti-prostitute, anti-porn feminists, and myself, who is called a pro-sex feminist or a sex worker feminist. The shift has gone from being a woman's body, a woman's choice, to a woman's body as long as she makes the right choice. It's gone from saying that we should honor the voices of women to saying, we should honor the voices of women who are saying what we want to hear. Now, recently, feminism has painted the prostitute not in the Christian terms of a scarlet woman, but in the politically correct terms of a pathetic woman, a pathetic victim. And an integral part of defending this degraded, humiliated, pathetic woman has been to attack, as I said, the people who are seen as her main victimizer, the men. And what I want to do, because there's very little time really, is to look at the one law that has been enacted that most commonly people say, of course, protects the prostitute, the streetwalker especially, and that is laws against pimps. It may surprise you that to a woman, if you were to go and ask Coyote members or Pony members, prostitutes of New York, hire members, the many networks of organizations that form the prostitutes' rights movement, they would come out against pimping laws. What I'm going to do right now is quote some opinions that I've gathered uh, from these organizations, uh, from the women that are within these organizations, 
Tim made reference to the fact that the internet is revolutionizing the prostitutes' rights movement. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be on Hornet. Hornet is uh, several dozen prostitutes and two non-prostitute, non-sex worker researchers, me being one of them, uh, who on a daily basis exchange notes about who has been imprisoned, what can we do about it, the state of uh, the whether or not Vancouver is going to be pa uh, passing its John School law, that sort of thing. And these quotes come from these women. The first woman wrote regarding, first of all, madams, quote, I would like the movement to be less oriented towards social work and more about giving people the skills and other things they need to be professionally successful. Key to this is supporting madams, pimps, and business owners instead of trashing them, whether subtly or directly, because in order to succeed and have staying power, a prostitute eventually has to become more entrepreneurial. A second prostitute said, quote, I think madams are a great asset to the industry. They're women who usually have first-hand experience and tend to be thorough when it comes to protecting their underlings. I have a bit of problem with pimps, however, especially with men whose only experience in the biz is from the demand side. The third whore came in to contradict her. What is the big fuss about pimps? If you're talking about people who but for a penis might be called madams, I don't see a problem. I might prefer to work with another lady, but that's a personality thing. When I was younger, I worked for an agency that was owned by two guys and one woman. They were all about the same thing, sometimes nice, sometimes annoying, like anyone else in the world." End quote. Now, one of the things you might notice about this exchange is it's all about business. It's not about, are these people abusive? Are they beating up people in the streets? Are they kidnapping? Are they torturing? Are they raping? It's all about, are they good business people? And the reason that the anti-pimping laws and the reaction to the pimp laws are conducted on that level is because if you read the pimping laws themselves, they do not condemn or punish a man for beating a woman, for kidnapping her, for raping her, for coercing her. Pimping laws merely establish that there is an economic relationship between a man and a woman. That's all they do and they prohibit that economic relationship. They do not define a pimp as a man who kidnaps. They make no reference at all to physical abuse. They refer only to financial arrangements. Do you live off of, do you receive the proceeds of prostitution? And so it becomes illegal for the prostitute to form the economic associations that most women take for granted. Whenever she gives money to her husband, to her family, to her parents, manager or friend, she legally endangers them. And remember, their arrests are now 50% women, 50% men. In a resolution entitled Statement on Prostitution and Human Rights, the International Committee for Prostitutes' Rights declared, quote, anti-pimping laws violate a prostitute's rights to a private life by putting all of her personal associates under even more risk of arrest than exploiters and physical violators. Confiscation of personal letters or literary work of prostitutes is a clear denial of respect for home because when they come and arrest the husbands, they break into the home usually in the middle of the night. Scarlett Harlot, one of the main activists in America, pleaded on behalf of her husband who was caught in just such a situation, quote, you want to make laws against pimps, make sure you make the distinction between forced prostitution and those who want to be in prostitution by choice. Go after those who actually abuse us. Just as in marriage, some husbands are abusive. Not all husbands are that way. Don't take away my husband because he's really good to me. But if you want to help women, go after those people who actually abuse us. But be very, very careful how you word the legislation that goes after those who you think exploit and abuse us because those laws ultimately will get used against us." End quote. In both the United States and Europe, it's common practice for the police to use anti-pimping laws to ignore a, right to, a total right to privacy, her right to association, if in fact she, and pimps don't have to be men, it can be anyone. So if a prostitute is out on the street, and for protection, because it is very dangerous on the street. 
For protection, she groups together with another woman. That woman can be arrested for pimping if, in fact, $5 or 10 cents for a cup of coffee changes hands. Now, why is it that pimps, in particular, are pulled out of the mix of prostitution and usually held up for special excoriation? Well, first of all, pimps and not madams are associated with street walking, which is the most violent prone and stigmatized force of prostitution, form of prostitution. The National Network of Sex Worker Projects, the National Task Force on Prostitution, has estimated that street walking consists of probably about 5 to 20 percent of the entire population of prostitutes. The rest, and the, and the widespread, by the way, depends largely on the size of the city. The 95 to 80 percent of prostitutes are usually invisible. They're the ones who are in call and out call, massage parlors, escort systems, uh, the clubs, and the call girls. Now, most people see the paradigm of a prostitute as a street walker because she's the one that's visible. She probably represents about 95% of all the arrests that police make because she's the one who's, who is the community nuisance. She's also the one that's most vulnerable. She's out there. She's more likely to be drug addicted. She's far more likely to be a, a victim of violence. And pimps. Because they are introduced into that system, uh, that system and of violence and drug abuse, are systematically portrayed as oppressors and exploiters of women by modern feminists. I'm not contending that pimps don't beat up women on the streets. What I'm saying is when you go to a community that you're supposed to be protecting, and all the laws that you, are, you see enforced for their protection, they say are hurting us. When you see that, you have to, if you have any honesty at all as a researcher, you have to stand back and say, there's something wrong with this picture. And over and over again, that's what you hear. Now, the image of a pimp as portrayed by feminism today is probably well expressed by Catherine Barry, whose influential book, Female Sexual Slavery, has pretty much defined that whole issue. And Catherine Barry writes, quote, together, pimping and procuring are perhaps the most ruthless displays of male power and sexual dominance. Procuring is a strategy, a tactic for acquiring women and turning them into prostitution. Pimping keeps them down there. Procuring today involves convincing a woman to be a prostitute through cunning, fraud, and or physical force, taking her against her will or knowledge and putting her into prostitution, end quote. Now, how can you reconcile this image of a pimp with the following observation by a whore. Quote, many of the men who get described as pimps are boyfriends, lovers, and license plate takers. And I'll pause on the quote right now because the importance of a license plate taker is if you are on the street, if you're one of that 5 to 20 percent out there, the only protection you might have against being very badly abused is if someone takes down a license plate number and has some record of where you are and who you went with. So this is a major filter and protection out on the street. Pimps are boyfriends, lovers, license plate takers, and managers. Many girls seek out pimps and even love their man. A girl has a right, even if she's a bit dumb and is being taken. And the venom of the law is another way to get at prostitutes and busting their lovers. If a bank teller's husband beats her, he is charged with assault. He is not charged with being a bank teller's husband. If a, bank, if a whore's husband treats her well, he is charged with being a whore's husband and thrown in jail, or at least subject to that. Now, the best explanation of the schism between these two portraits of the pimp, and a generous explanation, is that pimping is not a monolithic institution. Some pimps are husbands and friends who offer protection and partnership. Some offer alienation and abuse. But the ones that offer alienation and abuse are effectively protected by the law and the court systems. In the same book in which she defines a pimp in, in, as male violence inherently and by definition, Kathleen Barry reports talking to a street prostitute who had been raped and kidnapped by pimps and another who had been slashed by a razor by a pimp the night before. Barry mentions in passing 
that they, quote, didn't consider reporting it to the police, end quote. Barry details many of these horrifying cases, but she never comments on the fact that if they reported it to the police, the police and the court systems would be one more layer of abuse that these women would face. However, these same police and court systems would arrest the man for taking money, even if he never abused her, even if he protected her. Now, this is part of what has come to be seen in the prostitutes' rights movement as the absolute inevitability that any law that is passed to protect the prostitute is going to be used against her. It is not merely that it will be used by a court system and a police system that's overwhelmingly hostile. It's that basically any law that is enacted on prostitution is an attempt to control a consensual exchange. And if in fact you want to protect prostitution, the best way to do so is probably that I've ever heard is probably what Margot St. James says whenever she's asked, how can I best protect the streetwalker from pimps? How can I best protect her from violent johns? Her answer is twofold. Extend to the prostitute every single right that every woman in this room has and takes for granted. The right to walk down a street in safety, the right not to be beaten, the right, the right to have a rape reported and taken seriously. The second part of her question is, read my lips, no laws. Thank you. Curious Minds. There were questions about how legalized prostitution works out. The difference between legalization and decriminalization is, that the, is the same difference between government control and no government control. Uh, legalizing prostitution means that you have a situation like Nevada where, in essence, uh, in, as, as Vern said, it's very limited and the women who do not work in those rural areas are persecuted far more harshly than any other state in the United States because they are competing with the government monopoly from, from which the government makes huge amounts of money. The women, very uh, you hear horror stories from the Nevada brothels, um, and, and yet some women like them. Some women say they like those conditions. Mostly you hear horror stories where the women are like sexual civil servants. They do not keep their own hours. They cannot refuse certain customers if they're not abusive. They stay there for uh, days on end and have shifts. Uh, of course, practices change from brothel to brothel, but these are the general patterns. Now, that's legalization, where you take the, basically, you legalize, and women have to abide by certain laws that, that decriminalization is to say, make prostitution the same as being a waitress. The government or a secretary or uh, a writer, the government basically does not pass laws specifically aimed at any profession other than professions like prostitution. Just get the laws out. It's consenting sex. Don't legalize it. You know, read my lips, no laws. <laughs> what about abuses of sex workers in other countries? It may be that it's over-reported, but quite apart from that, it is rampant. In Thailand, it is rampant in Africa, and there is absolutely no way, when I talk about prostitution and defend prostitution on this continent, that I'm defending the practices that go on in Asia. There is no question that there is forced prostitution and trafficking over there. If there, but the way to do that is not to eliminate prostitution, it's the way to eliminate trafficking. A legitimate concern. In America, if you look at the Center for Disease Control, which is, which is the touchstone of the spread of AIDS in America, uh, they see basically in most of the prostitute community no greater rate of AIDS infection than the regular community of heterosexual women. Prostitutes have in their own self-interest been the biggest promoters of condoms in this country. The first condom to be shown on a TV program was shown by, I think it was Dolores French, using a banana, showing people how to use it. They have been the ones going out on the streets to the one population that is, when I say the regular population of prostitutes, I was distinguishing them from the streetwalkers because there is a higher incident of, of HIV in streetwalkers. Now, their rates are comparable to IV drug user rates. And there is a great deal of reason to believe that it is not so much heterosexual sex that is spreading uh, AIDS to them, but the fact that they are IV drug users. 
Someone said, isn't it pretty risky? Well, the health department and the, and the hordes that are organized were going out in the streets and handing out condoms to the streetwalkers. The police, if they found a streetwalker with a condom in her purse, used it as evidence in court against her of being a whore and threw her in jail for having the condom. They were confiscating the condoms. They were basically, take, one government hand was handing it out, the other government hand was taking it back. As soon as the prostitute got the condom she, and she saw a cop, she threw it out. Someone chided, you say you're a feminist, but you wrote a pro-porno book. Don't feminists warn that pornography incites violence? Uh, my first book uh, was on pornography. My second book was on, on sexual correctness. But in Japan, I looked at some Japanese pornography, which was the most overwhelmingly violent pornography I have ever seen in my life. It convinced me that, in fact, there was abuse going on that was not consensual, which I never saw in anything in pornography in, in America. Yet, Japan has, I think, the lowest rate of domestic violence, of abuse of women, of rape, rape on the streets, of women being beaten. There is no correlation at all between the violence in the pornography and the violence in the daily life. If you look at other countries, oh, such as Germany, you find this, this pattern. Once they legalize pornography, violence against women, in terms of rape at least, that's the statistics that's always thrown out, goes down. Someone wrote a book called The Happy Hooker, but that's not the reality according to the studies. One of the statistics that comes out all the time is that, that uh, women are, are drug addicted, they, they, they are beaten by men there. And what this comes from is they, they do self-selecting samples. And the self-selecting samples are from that 5 to 20 percent of the population that is out there and available and will talk to them. And of that 5 to 20 percent, which in no way represents the profile of the call girl, the, massa the massage parlor worker, of those five, they further filter it down to those who usually go to centers for treatment. And so they go to a drug center. They have already a self-selected, a, a minority representative, a representation of the community. And then the filter is those who are drug addicted. A further filter is those who want to get out of the community, don't like being a street walker. A further filter on that is those people who want to say what you want to hear, because you're the government authority who can actually give them the grants or give them the, the money and the, the um, you know, treatment that they're going for. This is part of a series on human sexuality. Watch for future programs. We hope you have found this program intellectually stimulating and that you will continue to investigate the ideas raised here. To connect with other like-minded individuals, please contact any of the dozens of free thought organizations, such as the American Humanist Association, American Atheists, the Center for Inquiry, and Atheists United. You may also email the producer directly via leebaker27 at gmail.com. This program has been distributed through the courtesy of Atheist United.